morning everybody, Alex Kinnis from Solomors here coming at you via selfie cam to bring you part two of the behind the scenes guitar recording for our debut album Depravity's Demise. Um, today we're going to be reamping guitars so I'm up at the ungodly hour of 7 a.m. so that I can fit in as much uh, noise making time as I possibly can so get ready for some fun. There are two ways that I record open air guitars, like from the, the speaker. Uh, one way is the actual 412 cabinet in the room with the speakers on it. That I'll use a lot for rhythm guitars because you get a lot more thump. And that's that's hard to do in an apartment because um, it has to be pretty loud to get the proper uh, resonance from the cabinet. Uh, this is the second way. This way I'll do lead guitars because they don't need that low end thump. A lot of that's going to be EQ'd out of it anyway. You're really just focusing on getting a nice sweet mid range and, and highs that cut but they aren't too harsh. This is what's colloquially known as a uh, speaker coffin. Um, I happen to have this nice little case around, but you can make it out of whatever you want. This is this happens to be, uh, I think it's an oscilloscope case from uh, the 30s or 40s, something like that. But it's nice dense plywood and it's um, riveted steel on the outside. It seals up real well and it happens to be the right size, so that's good. What you can't see underneath here is that uh, under the speaker, the whole bottom is mass loaded. The theory behind that is that you're taking the, the resonant frequency of the, the system, the being the, the case and the, the air inside it and the speaker and all that, and dropping it down to um, dropping it down below the, the resonance peak of the speaker. Um, that way you're, you're, you have enough mass that this whole system isn't turning into an amplifying device of any kind. You're actually damping the, the sound, preventing that translation, or um, preventing the vibration from being translated downward. Um, an example would be like an acoustic guitar is what you don't want to have. If I just take a speaker and stick it in a box, then you're, you're actually, you could be amplifying it through uh, the resonance, the sympathetic resonation of the box, plus the modal reinforcements of frequencies in there. If you had just a guitar string vibrating in open space, it wouldn't make a lot of noise, but when you put that on an acoustic guitar, it becomes a lot louder. So that's the principle here. Um, and then on top of that, it's just terry cloth and polyfill, um, and then, uh, I'm going to put felt over top of that and more polyfill and seal it up when I do the recording. Anyway, you can learn all about wave propagation and uh, mass loading and uh, frequency transmission, the movement of waves through solids and, uh, and liquids and fun things like this, the physics of engineering solids. I read textbooks for fun because I'm a geek. Anyway, reflected wave, incidental wave, transmitted wave, barriers, good times, lots of fun equations. Do your homework, kids. Hopefully you can see the speakers okay. Um, the grate down there is just so if anything horrible happens, the speakers don't go through the speaker, or the, the microphones won't go through the speaker cone because that would be bad. Uh, the speaker that's in there right now is an ear candy green machine. It's a pretty nice speaker. It has a, a British kind of sound. It's it's sort of G12T-ish, um, but it's it's a little bit sweeter. So the, the two mics I have on it right now are an Audix i5 and an SM57. Um, it's hard to go wrong with starting with the 57. The the i5 sounds a lot like it, but it's it's more open and less focused. Um, so this is the way that I've been miking guitar speakers for like 20 years now. So just start off with a 57 relatively near the middle, slide it off until it sounds kind of sweet, and then uh, at a 45 or so degree angle on the side, aim another guy there. The principle behind this is that the 57 in the middle is the main sound and you're going to mix in the, the mic at the angle for uh, phase cancellations to, to sweeten up the high end and you're going to control where your mid-range peaks and valleys are with that mic there. Um, so they're obviously not going to be at the same level. You're not going to just be able to set them and say, hey, that's fine. Uh, you'll have to dink around with this one. But you find the position for the, the direct on-axis mic first and then bring this up in the background. So I already have those where I like them, so you don't have to sit through that whole process. But you could get lucky and get that right away, or it could take hours of frustration. Um, but that's usually that's the genesis of where everything starts. The other options that I might add, depending on what I need, is... Um, 
possibly a pencil condenser like this guy if I need a little bit more um, if I need a little bit more resonance or warmth or body uh, I'll take this and usually that'll go somewhere out toward the edge of the cone um, either straight on usually at an angle or though something right about there ish and if I want ha something that has a little bit more of a of a distant type of a feel to it like if this is too hard and direct um, I'll take a, a large diaphragm condenser like that guy sit it back anywhere from like a foot to three feet obviously the case will have to be open in that case a foot to three feet out in the room um, usually it'll be right around here ish and usually I'll stick it so that it's about halfway between the cone the edge of the cone and the dust cap um, and then slide it up and down depending on where it sounds sweetest Now coming out of the computer, the signal's going to go uh, directly to this guy before it hits the speaker. This was an amp that I built specifically to do the, the solos and lead parts of this album. Um, the popular thing in metal these days are amps that are real, real chiseled and tight sounding. I wanted something for the leads to make it sound a little bit more fluid and organic, um, and a little bit warmer and kind of scronky and fuzzy. Um, and I, I knew of some types of amps that, that got kind of what I was looking for, but I figured I would just take an opportunity to, to build something from scratch. I don't need much of an excuse to build something from scratch because um, it's just something that I like doing. But um, anyway, this right here, uh, completely original design built from the ground up specifically to do the solos for this. It's not tight. It's a little bit, it's a little bit loose um, on the bottom end, um, and it has a, a whole lot of controls you can see here. Uh, going from the input to output, there's standard gain, there's tightness, um, which is just a high pass filter going right out of the first stage. Um, your standard tone stack that comes after the preamp, so low, middle, high, the, the mid-range uh, slope is, is uh, sweepable. After that, it has an additional stage post-EQ. I called that saturate. I wasn't sure what else to call it. Um, then the master volume going into the phase inverter. Um, it's a 50-watt, 12-AX7, or... Um, 12x7 EL34 output stage um, and then that goes into uh, a negative feedback stage that goes around the, from the output to the uh, input of the phase inverter that's switchable in and out depending on um, how loose I want the the response and if it's switched in it also has a presence and resonance control just for the the low end and the high end um, and then it has a, a cut control in the, on the phase inverter just to uh, take the zip off of the, the high highs if there's anything that's a little bit too grainy because of the presence control. So I'll flip that over so you can see what it looks like inside. Obligatory gut shot. It's quite a science fair project going on in there. But anyways. Coming out of the amp, before it hits the speaker, it goes into um, this guy, which is just, it's a 100 watt stereo L pad, and um, that goes post output stage of the amp and pre-speaker. Um, that lets me just get the output stage cranked to where it sounds decent, and then turn the volume down a little bit. Um, it's, it's pretty much just a, a, a dummy load and a power soak. Uh, I don't take a whole lot off because I don't, it, you don't need it to be too loud, but I want to be able to get it, not necessarily for the output stage loud enough, but I want to be able to get the um, the phase inverter uh, cranking a little bit too, because you have this turned, your master turned way down, it's, it's a little bit thin and fizzy. All right, now onto the actual reamping. Uh, hopefully you can see this a little bit. Um, I've got my punch point set up here on either side of the solo. I've got uh, the clean track right here that's going to be played out to the amp, and I have my channel set up. New Solo Reamp 57C, that's 57 in the center. New Solo Reamp I-545, that's the one on the 45 degree angle. I'm going to drag this back a little bit here, make some room for it, and we're going to record the actual solo that's going on the CD now. So, um, here goes history.
Alrighty, that probably sounds like crap through the tiny little uh, camera microphone, but um, trust me, it sounds awesome here. But uh, anyways, that's going to be mixed with the other microphones, EQ'd, compressed, and sent in with the other stuff. And um, that's what's going to end up on the CD. Let me talk to you a little bit about how I EQ solos for a, a mix here. Hopefully you can see everything okay. This is just a standard uh, EQ plug-in. Um, this is the, uh, the basic roughing out of it. Where I'm going to start is just a high and low pass filter. Um, the high pass I have pretty steep, 18 decibels an octave, and that's set up around like anywhere between 10 and 14 or 15 K. I'm going to set it all the way up at 15 so that it doesn't mess with the high end until I'm figured out what I want to do here. Uh, the low end EQ I have shelved off. I'm just going to set that at 100. Um, the thump of uh, the speaker system on a for a guitar amp is going to be right around like 80, 90 ish. So I'm going to start dipping around 100 at uh, 12 decibel an octave slope. Um, the se second thing you want to do is take control of the low end on the uh, the guitar solo because you don't want too much of that of the pick attack blurring all your notes out. So I use a, a mild shelf EQ. It's a, a peaking shelf EQ. Usually right somewhere around like 200 to 250 ish. What I'll do is set it at 200 and then mess with the the Q that sets the little hump here until that's around like 450 or 500 and up a few decibels. And then I'll, I'll sweep the slope around until I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, I'll play it. I have uh, the solo on loop. I'll play it through the speakers. Hopefully you can hear and it doesn't just sound like fizz. But uh, I'll mess with that until the, the thump is reasonable. You can hear that on this little... There's too much thump and scrape there, so I take about six decibels off of that, and that, that helps the pick attack pop a little bit. Uh, second place coming up is right around here, the honky frequencies. Um, if you have too much going on in the mids, and I want to cut too much because it's a solo and I want it to have uh, a little bit of girth, but if you have too much between like 800 and 1K, um, it can sound really kind of honky and uh, in a bad way. So usually I will dip that about three to six decibels and then uh, loop it a little bit, boost it and sweep around until I find the annoying frequency. Right there, that's really annoying. So I'll take that in, that was about like 830 hertz and I'll dip that down until I'm happy with it. See, it gets too scooped down here, so I want to bring it up about like, it sounds, sounds about like four decibels of cut. Sounds pretty good there. Now we're going to move on to the next one. This next band is pretty important for solos. This is the one that's going to give you your, your snarl, that kind of snarly-ish throatiness kind of thing. Um, so this is one you want to be pay particular attention to. Usually what I want to bring out is between 1.2K and like 1.8K or something, one, somewhere between 1 and 2K. And it's usually going to be between 3 and 6 decibels of boost. And you want to get that nice throaty... Uh, weight to the pick attack and a snarl without making it sound honky. So let's listen to that first part again. I'm going to boost it up a whole lot. See, that's a little weird and nasally. If I bring it down, it gets too muddy around 1K. So 1.3, 1. 1. yeah, 1.3-ish sounds good. And then I'm just going to drop it down until I'm happy with it. So it's looking like it's it's taken a good amount of boost before it's uh, getting weird. So it's probably going to be about like five decibels of boost at like 1.3k. Um, then what we have up here, there are really two two major bands that I want to worry about, and then a bunch of smaller bands. So the the next one up is going to be um, the presence band, the one that puts it in your face or makes it fade further back in the mix. Usually that's around 4K, somewhere between 
like 3500 and 4500 something like that so um the way that i have the mix set up i have the guitars notched out at 4k and the vocals boosted a little bit there um it's like kind of some complimentary boost cut eq to keep them from stomping on each other but for the solo you don't have to worry about that because that's you know you're you're just worried about the solo being up front and you're not competing with anything else so um I'm going to boost that a whole lot and listen to it and then sweep it around between three and five and see where it sounds cutting. So it sounds a little too eeky up around 45. And it doesn't have enough cut around 35. I'm gonna put it like 3.8, and then if I if you feel like I need a little bit more of that like Eddie Van Halen spank off the pick attack, um, I'll boost it up to like 42. It sounds pretty good here, but right now it's gonna fit around like 3.8, and I'll drop that down here to about like four or five decibels of boost. And the last band, I'm not gonna mess with too much right here until I get it in the mix and listen to things. But that's that's this one where I call it the grit. Um, it's right below, right, right ab above 10K is, they kind of call that the air. Below that, here I call it the grit. That's between like 8 and 10K. That's where the, the real, uh, like, scrapey, granular type of the, the sound is. Um, that real presence that you get off the, the crease in the cone um, when you're micing a speaker. So that's, that's what'll really kind of make that scrapiness stand out in the mix if i feel like it's getting a little bit too washed out or something like that i'll take that up but usually i don't, I don't want to mess with that with a solo because it can sound a little bit it can sound a little bit eeky uh like ice pick in your ears type thing so that stays down until i hear it in the mix and see if i want to see if i want to mess with that at all this next part can get really annoying so I, I won't walk you through the whole thing but i'll just generally show you what i'm going to do here i set the the cues right here the the cue is the width as far as the bandwidth and your octave that your eq is going to be a real narrow cue so you get a spike like that if you can see that spike there and this is going to be all the stuff between like 5k and probably like 9k 10k something like that but uh, this is where you take the little abnormalities in the high end and just cut them out. So I'll, I'll loop the guitar track and sweep this real narrow bandwidth around until I hear it whistle. And when it really, really jumps, then I'll, I'll make the bandwidth even narrower and completely cut it out like that. So you can hear that right there. It was just, that's a real harsh whistle. Um, looks like it's around... 5.3 so I'm going to take that down as narrow as it goes and then drop 5.3 out of the spectrum and I'll, I'll play you that back and forth so you can see I, I don't know if you're gonna be able to hear the difference in the mic here but I can hear in the studio monitors that it's, it's a lot less eeky, it smooths out the, the high end a lot more. And I'll do that with four or five of these. So I'll listen for the next one up in sequence. That harmonic right there is super annoying. I don't know, what is that? That's like 7.5K-ish. So I'll drop that down, drop the bandwidth down. And then mess with that until I find all of them and then um, either boost or cut depending on how annoying it is and the, the balance between them and uh, and the the major control up at 10k that I use in the other EQ until it sounds smooth but still grainy enough that uh, that it sounds tough and it has enough bite that you can tell what's going on one more thing as far as the signal flow before it gets into the um, the delay, I run it through two different compressors, and this is kind of boring nuts and bolts stuff, so I won't bore you with it too much. But I have two compressors right here. This first one, this is just your standard compressor. Um, this one has a quick attack time. I'm going to set it just to take a couple decibels off the top, so that's going to kick in right away. And that's a ratio of like three or four to one, so it's, it's pretty mild. And that's just going to smooth out the, uh, the attacks a little bit between the... Um, the various picking techniques and the tapping stuff. And then this one, th this one's pretty transparent. This one is not. 
the one on the right side is definitely not transparent. It's a great plug in. This is a freeware version of uh, this Klanghelm DC1A, is what it's called. Um, I found it through uh, kvraudio.com and it's it's pretty good for mangling stuff. It has a it has a lot of character, so do not put that on something that you want a transparent compressor on, but it's real good for something like this. Um, it has a, a pretty slow, relatively speaking, attack time and uh, not a whole lot of control over anything except the input and the output, but they, they have a pretty profound effect depending on where you set it. So I set that through there to kind of mangle the, the transients on the sustained stuff. So the, the quick picking, it doesn't really do too much. Um, the longer notes, the bends and that type of thing, it gives it a real like kind of grittiness and it definitely, it definitely has a, like a throb to it. Definitely has a pulse at the end as opposed to a, a nice clean um, release time like a, like some compressors do. Last thing I'm going to do is show you a couple time-based uh, delay tricks that I'm going to mess around with, and um, that's about it. Uh, so right here we have a, it's just a delay, a regular old delay. Set it to note values, and I'm going to mix in just a little bit, like 5% of the signal of an eighth note here. And that's just going to give a little bit of wetness, but it's not going to obscure the pick attack like an immediate delay would. You you can use a or a um, a reverb. You can use a reverb with a pre-delay, which I will through a through a sub bus. I'll I'll aux that out and mix a little bit in. Um, but for right now, I just have a little bit of delay. And then to widen up the image a little bit, I'm going to set this to a real quick note value, like a like a 32nd note or a 64th note, and then mess with the mix until it pushes the signal a little bit out wider so that it doesn't sound like it's as in your face. This center channel, this is still going to be right in your face and then this one's going to broaden the image a little bit. So that just kind of gives it some air and some, some, uh, some depth, some width in the mix without washing it out completely. And then I'm going to uh, Mix the reverb in on an aux track after that. All right, so I've got all that in there and leveled, and uh, right here is our solo section, so I'll give you a little sneak peek of that. Shh, don't tell anybody. Hopefully it doesn't sound like complete crap through these speakers, but this is just to give you an idea what's going on here. Um, this block of yellow in the middle, these are our five guitar tracks that I laid and mixed all together. They're all sub bus to those effects that I showed you and walked through. Um, all this up top, on top of it, these are Trav's drums. He laid some really cool jazzy stuff down underneath this. So here is the solo. So there you go. So thanks again for checking us out. That's it for now. This is Alex Kennish from Solomore saying um, thank you to everybody. Um, check us out on uh, solomores.com for the most up-to-date news or our Facebook page. We also have a Twitter feed and a YouTube feed. Um, back us on our Kickstarter. If you haven't become a backer yet, go to kickstarter.com. Just search for Solomores and um, you can back us there, uh, donate to the project, or just use it to pre-order the CD or get some uh, cool and unique merch. Some one-of-a-kind stuff is up there. And thanks a lot. We'll see you again real soon.